Hey, what's up, my BMX nerd friends? Welcome back to another episode of Canode Knows brought to you by Dig BMX. This week, I got to talk to one of my videographer, filmmaker idols. Joe Simon is on the show today. Uh, if you're watching on Dig's YouTube, make sure you smash, and let's smash that like button and subscribe and leave a five-star review so that the show can keep growing and spreading. And thank you guys for all the messages you guys have sent. I uh, hope you uh, enjoy this episode. Joe's so sick, and his story is actually... He's been in the game for a long time. We talked about everything from his BMX career to what he's doing now as a DP and cinematographer outside of, and he dominated the wedding space, but you'll get into it. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this one. Hit up rarlife.com, promo code Canode, and get 15% off Rar Superfoods. And yeah, yeah, that's enough. Here's Joe Simon. Hey, Joe Simon, you long haired, luscious, beautiful man. How you doing? What up, what up? Good to chat. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, shit. So you've gone the furthest out of BMX. If I had to make a wager, I would say you've gone the furthest from BMX into the film world and your, the success you've had. Like, But I'm not sure if everybody knows your whole story. Um, while I was kind of like researching you, I found uh, you had some clips on a really old like ride, uh, ride a really old ride video and then uh and then i was looking into the shadow i think it was called the calling what was the, the calling, shadow yeah. video that you directed the calling the calling oh. yeah, that was one i did yeah and i had some shots in the next into the void but i think at that point i was like no more bmx videos i'm done with this shit yeah and, uh, <laughs> and then obviously i made more later on but <laughs> you did do you ended up making like mutiny videos that stood out because it was the most high quality bmx videos at the time like it's like 2007 or 8 i think let's get mystical right yeah yeah right around that time i think 2008 that i mean and at that time hd was just getting introduced to bmx and you fucking you you really did it man but uh let's start <laughs> yeah, with this what's time, your man. what's your earliest memory in uh in your bmx life in my BMX life. I mean, probably the earliest memory is where I started was uh, at that point I was living in Long Island by right Sh in Shoreham, which is kind of like the one of those epic BMX tracks back in the day. If anybody was a racer knows that world. Um, I lived a block, two blocks from the track. So my friend had like the shitty 60 inch Kent bike and uh, I borrowed it and we went and broke into the track in the middle of the week and just were riding. And I was like, dude, this is amazing. And I basically just was at this point I was 16 ish 15 16 so 16 inch bike was way too small for me but it was just what my neighbor had so we were just shredding jumps on those until I destroyed it basically but that's yeah sick. that was like that was like the beginning of it and our middle school had a had trails behind the middle school so basically we'd ride the trails and then we'd we'd race on the weekends I had like a elf double cross and Rob, uh, Robin Rallis was racing and uh, camp, a few other people at that track were like, you know, the, the stars. As yeah. It stays. So, yeah, yeah. Who was the first like star that you ran into and you were like, holy shit, that's that's is it Robbie Morales? Uh, no, I think Ron, uh, Ronnie Gasca, I believe Damn. is the name. Keith Terra was there back in the day and Brian Irochi, kind of like that whole crew um, was at the track. I was like this really loser beginner kid even though like i think they're actually younger than me uh i just started so late that by the time i got in i was like the beginner on the bike that was yeah. you know couldn't do shit and they were just like flying over all the jumps and i was like man that's sweet i've been yeah. i started when i was pretty late too like 15 or 16 and i just never never learned how to jump i can net like i just stuck to learning shit on flat ground but it seems like you <laughs> you figured it out um, I started. Watch, I started racing though, so it's kind of like that's that's where I got my start was racing and jumps. And that's a cheat code street. for bike control. Yeah, like mm -hmm. BMX street riders who started racing have the the biggest advantage. It's crazy. I just like built in. It's like the bike's part of you. Um, shit. What? Very what's true, your uh, true. thinking back? Uh, I mean, this is like 2005, the shadow video came out. What's your favorite memory of like being a pro? Like you're, you know, you're pro a, a, sec a section or whatever. Uh, yeah, I feel like pro is such a loose term, at least yeah. I mean, even back then. I mean, it was, here's a sticker pack and uh, <laughs> a, fr a frame and you're like, this is awesome. <laughs> I um, made it. Yeah, I made it. Uh, I, I mean, like the shadow, shadow conspiracy was awesome because I was, 
you know, I was at the start of that with, you know, Ron Bonner and Alistair Witten and John Jennings and Ryan Schur and Byron Anderson. It was like our group was there at the beginning. It was like all these secret meetings, like we're going to start this company. And, you know, Damn. Ron was like, I'm starting this company and like, we want you to be a part of it. And so we started putting together, you know, the video and, and um, for the calling and like all these like other, you know, weird printouts and, you know, online things kind of like this before uh, that kind of media was made, I guess, you know, okay. kind of like creating all this hype. Um, so it was a lot of fun being at the beginning of that and, and watching it all unfold and, and getting to travel and make that video kind of in, in secret, um, just with a small crew, you know? And so yeah, that was fun. It was actually the way Ronnie first set that up too, is like, it was one of those things like, I actually want to pay you guys. I want you guys to get residuals from the parts and like, you're going to get a percentage of the company every month and we're going to send you paychecks. And it was like the first time I actually was paid you know, nice. in a way that was like real, not just like, I think we sold 10, 150 of your frames. So it's uh, calculated to $10. You know, it's like some bullshit <laughs> math. And like, yeah. is this real? It was actually like a real, like, uh, you know, paycheck of, of, in a sense. So that was, that was rad. And um, but yeah, just making that video was fun. You know, I think that was my last, well, uh, my first and last shadow video. But before that, I'd done a few mutiny videos at that point. Um, because I had done Subversion, um, which I think was my first full length video I made. Um, and then- Meaning you filmed and edited it. Filmed and edited it, yeah. Okay. That whole thing was probably my first one. No, no, actually the first one was a Trend 2001 was the first video I did. No um, shit, okay. Yeah, so that was like late 90s. I basically, so I lived in Long Island, um, grew up racing there. Then my parents moved to Dallas, Texas, or Arlington, Texas. And so there I, I, the racetrack was a shit. So I like, we went to Fort Worth and it's not like, you know, um, East coast racing where you show up and there's hundreds of people racing in Fort Worth, there was five people. And I was yeah. like, this is so boring. And so I started just riding more trails and dirt jumping. Um, and that's when I connected with, uh, um, Steve Inge who owned poor boy back at, back then and allied and all those companies. And then who started mutiny eventually. And I started working for him at the shop. Um, just kind of like, you know, doing whatever I could. And then eventually I got prototype mutiny frames. Um, and I've, I kind of moved to California for a short stint and then moved to Austin in 98, where I kind of like met all the trend people who's now empire. Um, and so at that point I was already filming for mutiny stuff and I'd filmed a whole bunch of stuff and they're like, Hey, why don't you make a trend video for us? So I made a full length trend video started. We probably filmed 99, 2000 or just 2000 for that video. I, you can't find it anywhere online. Um, I think mostly because once trend turned into empire and there's like a, a lot of bad blood between the owners and like whatever else happened. Um, Tina and Tom are amazing. You know, they are the ones that ended up with, with the, the shop and, and I love those dudes, but I think because it's trend, it's kind of been buried instead huh. of yeah. empire stuff. So I was just today, I was like, shit, I have it. I have the master on a mini DV tape. So I need to re-earth that and get it online because there's, this is my favorite stuff I've ever done is on that video. Damn. Like, yeah. Absolutely. I can't find anyone online. Like, shit. Yeah. yeah. So there's like, you a, just have it on a mini DV tape. Yeah. I have a 20 stair backwards rails, probably the best thing I've ever did. That's on and there. It's not like, nowhere to be day, found. Nowhere to be found. Shit. Plus you can find it in the yeah. old ride interview I did. Yeah. Back in the day in, in the magazine, but yeah, that's wild. Yeah. yeah so you were involved. I mean, I was, I was just, so I just talked to rat boy and his yeah, period saw that. Of time was, awesome. was like 99 to 2000 was about like when he was kind of peak or at least maybe not peak, but just getting, getting into it and the street riding. So like this period of time, he was saying like street riding wasn't really, you know, people weren't breakless. They didn't, they weren't out there doing grinds and stuff. And it was just like BMX trails and stuff like that. So to be different. So that's crazy that you were like, you were in in the game had you known about rat boy and did you ever bump into him or i like that i don't think i ever bumped into him i definitely bumped bumped into the uh the guns a couple times in arizona riding what was he um, like um wild yeah that's right. i mean you just be like you brought riding somewhere and you're like oh shit this homeless guy is gonna come assault us and like oh shit no it's guns so it's crazy <laughs> and then you, you know it's like things like that you know um, yeah it was maybe once or twice it wasn't it wasn't often um because in those early years, we did like a couple road trips for mutiny, early 2000s out into Arizona, 
you know, because the, the ditches like were just insane. So yeah. you should just go there because I love riding ditches and sub rails and sub boxes. One of my favorite things. So we do got the ditches out here in Arizona and the thorns, a lot of flats, a lot of <laughs> yeah, flats for real there. goat heads. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's like it was like, you know, moving. Uh, I, I was out in L.A. for six months because I grew up in L.A. and then moved to Long Island. So I was like, I'm going to go back to L.A. That's where the riding is. And, you know, I just had a hard time with the driving because I was riding sheep hills for a while and it was just two hours of driving every time you wanted to go do something and it kind yeah. of got over it. So then I moved to Austin and when I did come to Austin, I literally sold everything, got on a Greyhound bus from LA, um, worked at Best Buy. I just bought a digital eight camera from Best Buy working there with my employee discount. So then we started filming my sponsor me tapes, you know, all that shit. Yeah. Moved to Austin because like, this is the Mecca, this is where everybody came, you know? So and then just being able to just ride around and see, you know, it's like Joe Rich and Sandy Carson and Jimmy yeah. LeVan and like all these epic dudes that were, they're only a few years older than me, but you know, at that time their progression was so much further than anyone else as far as yeah. you know, what you see. And like you cruise around town to the spots and to see them filming, like kind of like try to hang out and watch them get some clips <laughs> and uh, you know, tr tail around with them for a while until they tell you to get lost. Like, oh, we're gonna go ride some stuff. We can stop hanging around. How old are you at this point in 2001? Uh, um, I was, tw well, I turned 21 in 99. And I think that was kind of the time, like 98, 99, like 98 Road Fools, like all that stuff was all in Austin. So I'm like, that was the time that I really started, I think, progressing a lot in my riding. Yeah. Um, probably till like 2002. That was like my big, my, I think my best years were in that era, like 98 to 2002, probably. That's tough. Um, where I was really pushing it before I became more, you know, concerned with the film filming side of it than the writing side of it. You know, yeah. I had to make that choice because I was like, you get to a spot and you're like, oh yeah, this is awesome, I'm gonna ride. And then you're like, oh shit, I got to film. So it's like, do I want to film or do I want to ride? You got to. Yeah. I know that dilemma of like, for me, I can't really do both. I can't go out and be the mm -hmm. filmer and the writer. It's like a mindset of just like, okay, I'm I'm filmer guy today or, like it's i don't know it put, totally puts me out of the groove if i'm like getting behind the camera sitting down and then once somebody lands their clip they're like okay your turn bob and i'm like no i've been sitting here dude i don't want to i don't want to ride <laughs> what what exactly. was what went into that decision to like kind of transition from being a writer to getting into filmmaking or yeah filmmaking i think it was it was really you know that right it's i felt that i i could either ride and get the clips or I could film. But if I was gonna film, if I was trying to do both, it was half, I was like half ass filming, you know, cause you're just like, oh, let me get this shot so I can ride, you know, yeah. and get back to riding versus being like, I'm just here to film and let me just, what's the right angle for this? You know, how can I make it look the biggest possible, you know, for for this person that's riding or, you know, to do it justice, right? It's so hard to do justice to, to, to clips, you know, it really you've is. seen so many things. Like you see someone do something like that. Nah, that's, that's not that cool. And you go to the spot and you're like, fuck, that's crazy. Yeah. You know? For real. It's even, it's really hard. even if it's done like perfectly, like the shit, however it's filmed, it still doesn't like translate, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. I think that, and that, you know, I, I still, you know, was riding for quite some time. I think all the way till, um, like like at a decent level till probably like 2006 or seven and then kind of like started keeping it chill like you know i was i was riding even yesterday at the skate park i busted my ribs doing a uh alley-oop grind at, at the bowl so i got some nice bruised, rib, bruised ribs today so <laughs> it's like still riding 44 yeah. you know still happening but Dude, bmx um, hurts <laughs> just just not i'm just not trying to you know i'm not trying to send it i'm like i'm going to be comfortable i want to jump and like do the things i love to do but i'm not going to try to kill myself and do the things that down. like feel good you know yeah, exactly it looks like it's turned fit. down you know yeah. all right are you like working out eating healthy like i i mean for a 44 year old you look younger you look young you look <laughs> you're glowing Thanks. joe what's Thanks. your what's your uh, secret man i just i'm active i'm very active i i kind of like um an all sports person in the sense that um I just pretty much all my travels involve riding like i'm either riding mountain bikes or i'm snowboarding or i'm surfing or you know hiking or like i'm just doing stuff all the time yeah that's so. that's that's most of it and trying to stay healthy because i think that i don't you know riding bmx we've all had a lot of injuries and it's 
they definitely catch up to you. And it's like, you know, when you're twenties and you fall, you're like, ah, oh, great. And next week you're fine. Yeah. And you're 40 and you fall. Like I sprained my ankle last September, like a year and three months ago, my ankle's still fucked, you know? So it's like <laughs> the older real. you get, the longer it takes to heal. And it sucks because you're like, oh, that's not bad. I'll be, I'll be fine in a couple of weeks. And it's like, yeah. nope. So <laughs> like the stronger you can keep your body, the, my hope is that, you know, when I'm 70, I can still be like doing those things. You know, I, like I've, I really love surfing now. It's like one of my favorite things. And I, I, I think it's because it's more, a little more low impact. It's something that I can hopefully do for a long time. And it's that yeah. feeling you're still pumping and you're like, it's almost like riding trails in a sense, but you're riding a wave. It's, you know, it's, that's it's so sad. Yeah. I've never been, never been, uh, surfing, but dude, I can re- like, I'm not even that old. I'm 32, but I blew my back out like four days ago, sneezing in the, <laughs> it's still, like, so to the point where I couldn't, you know, I can't work out. I can't ride my bike right now. It's fucked. I'm like, God damn it, dude. That's, <clears throat> that's it. I literally, I was just surfing two weeks ago and I took a, the board smashed me in my quad and I couldn't walk for a day. And then like, I was fine two days later. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm okay. And then I like broke my toe basically, uh, <laughs> somehow. And then my foot was fucked for, I don't even know, a couple weeks. And then, and now I've hurt my ribs. So it's like, you know, it's just constantly, I feel like I'm hurt yeah. all the time from <laughs> trying to live life. <laughs> So I want to get into, you know, your post post BMX videography life. But before I do that, I kind of want to like get the rundown of like your uh, sponsorship, you know, uh, journey, who was your first yeah. sponsor? And then who was your second? How, how did it evolve? Oh, that's a good question. I think my first, my first sponsor um, was poor boy, probably um, poor boy and allied. But back, back in the day, it's like, uh, you know, made t-shirts. I'm not sure how many people will remember any of that. Um, but I've it was never like, heard of poor, poor boy, man. Poor is like, you know, big graphic tees with like cartoonish characters, okay. jumping bikes and stuff like that. It was yeah. mid nineties was really popular, especially, uh, you know, kind of in the racing, I guess. And then allied was a, a branch off of that. It was all by S- Steve Inge who eventually started mutiny. Um, so I was sponsored by them, just clothing, and then um, then Mutiny picked me up, and uh, I wrote a few of the pro- first prototype frames. Were like they were like tanks; they were you know huge, heavy bikes. Some of the frames had yeah. like the head tube that was penetrated, you know, <laughs> with the frame coming out the other side, uh, kind of like the War Pig kind of yeah. classics stuff like that. You know, because back then it was like to make a frame stronger, just like put more gussets on it, more metal, like yeah, it'll make just it be stronger. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. <laughs> I mean, bikes were so heavy. Um, but then, um, yeah, so then I, those are my sponsors then. And then uh, I was sponsored by a couple of shoe companies. Um, oh man, I'm trying to think of the shoe company. Um, Derek Adams, you know, who did Little Devil, sponsored by Little Devil for a little bit. Sick. Um, and then his shoe company, which I can't remember what it was called back in the day. Um, sponsored by them for a little while we had man we had we just had these mailing wars like they just mailed me like weird shit in the mail and i'd mail them weird shit back um that was pretty funny because that was before the internet so you couldn't send emails and yeah did snail mail um and then 2000 and i'm trying to think maybe four three four somewhere in that world gaz sanders and i both bought mutiny from steve Inge. so we were partners in mutiny bikes for probably the next till like 2008 until I read I, that. What is that? Let's, was let's, let's linger that on that. Yeah, let's linger on which, like, how, how do you go? How do you even approach like, Hey, I want to buy a bike company. Like what? How well, I think that... it was, it was, Steve was, you know, at that point in his, in his life, he was moving from Fort Worth and he was going East to pursue a different venture. And so he, you know, as one of the sponsored team writers and basically the, the person making all the films he was like i'm, I'm gonna you know kind of shut it down and i was like well maybe i would be interested in buying it from you so you know my friend my best friend still to this day you know we hang out constantly we were who i was riding with him yesterday he's from the uk and um gaz? i was like hey do you, yeah gaz okay yeah he grew up in darby and i used to go visit him in darby like in the late 90s i'd go to the uk for like a month and just hang out we'd ride bikes in the summertime and you know Sick. travel around just you know doing dumb shit and filming yeah. um but yeah so we both just kind of got raised the money on our own our own ends and um bought the company from steve and just dove into like how do you run a bike company no idea 
yeah a lot of <laughs> trial and error trying to figure that out <laughs> and um you know like everybody knows you don't really make money in bmx so it's you know yeah. it's definitely a, a passion that you have to want to support the you know the industry and just the, the love of bmx to to make it work you know year by year so, right and when i think yeah. of mutiny i think of gaz and joe that like gaz and joe just goes together in my brain because i've heard it so many times gaz and joe gaz and joe and mutiny lasted a long time i think it just recently stopped right or is it still around it's still it's still going it's just um I think Gaz, uh, was it last year? He, he basically stopped doing like big distribution and kind of like all that stuff. And it's basically just like direct sales only. They do small runs of frames and really just okay. fra frames that like he's into and, you know, the few people on a team that are like really like trail rider oriented in that sense that, um, yeah, that want to ride and just, just for the love of it. So he's, he's still making bikes because, you know, it's, it's kind of a niche market um, to, to make those frames. So for real. Cool. What was like the biggest takeaway from buying and running a bike company? Like, what'd you learn if you could learn? I mean, you probably learned a lot, but hit me with one less one business lesson that you, that one you learned. Business lesson, man. I don't know. It's uh, probably just dealing with international, um, just doing international business relations is difficult, you know, because all, you know, most of the products were done in, in you know, overseas. And just getting molds done and, and just like trying to translate between different cultures and figuring all that out is really difficult. I think yeah, that's, I, bet. I, I think people don't understand. They're like, oh, let's make a grip or let's make whatever. It's like, okay, you got to open up a mold. You need to make 30,000 of them. And like, that's going to cost you, you know, whatever, $100,000. And do you have that much money that you may never recoup? Yeah. So it's, it's, big it's not that easy. Yeah, yeah for real. Were or you like scared? For frames and like all that kind of stuff. Uh, no, because I was too stupid to be scared. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, my guy, <laughs> you know, it's like that yeah. kind of thing. You're like, ah, this, this is easy. No problem. Then yeah, you make fuck it. I'll figure things. it out. Yeah. yeah. What was your biggest um, mistake? Um, man, I can't even remember. I, we never did anything. We never did anything that dumb where we over ordered, you know, or anything like that. So it was, it, it was pretty small. So in that, that bad. Um, yeah. I'm sure Gaz will remember a mistake that we made, but I, and my memory is terrible. I'm always like, yeah, it all seemed to work out pretty well, yeah. you know. Is it under? Because I know, like, um, for Sparkies, for example, has you know Shadow and Sabrosa, and it's all under one distribution. Is was Mutiny? It's just kind of a one-off thing, or is it under an umbrella? Like, how was what was the structure of it? Like, it Mutiny just a frame company alone? Like, ran out yeah, of that's inches. it. Yeah. Huh. So I mean, Mutiny was at one point. I'm sure he had a overall business umbrella for it at that point, you know, with uh, his other clothing companies. But once we purchased Mutiny, it was just, you know, that was it, just Mutiny, because we didn't do anything else. That's yeah. interesting, man. That's so, I, when I read that you guys bought it, I was like, damn, that's a bold move, man. <laughs> <clears throat> it seemed easier to buy something than to start another bike. Like, there's so many bike companies, and every, you know, every couple months, someone's like, I have a great idea. Let me start a new frame company because yeah. there's none, not enough of those around. You're like, all right, cool. <laughs> I've seen a couple of those come and go, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard work, you know? And then I think I was, I think in 2008, um, I basically left the company just because it was, you know, my pursuit of filmmaking was either like I a hundred percent into filmmaking or I'm one foot in filmmaking, one foot. Right, in the yeah. Match, which it's just not same thing. Half ass one. You can't. Yeah, it's too hard. It's too hard because the the filmmaking world is, um, you know, it's you have to be like 150 percent all the time right. because your chances of actually succeeding are so low. You know, until you're established enough. And, and back then, I I was you know I was doing nothing except just trying to make enough money to survive. And you know get the next job so how were you making money to survive like when you at that point in time when like what was the last bmx video you were making and how were you making a living while you were doing it so i think you know making bmx films you know there's wasn't at, at least at that point there wasn't really money to be made i remember right. you know a few times say like let's get mystical i can't remember you know, we're like, okay, this is the amount allocated to me to make this film for a whole year, which was not much, you know, obviously, right. but, um, I would guess like 20 K maybe not. I don't think it was less. even that. 
Okay. It was less. Gotcha. Than that. Yeah. I think it was. I, I think it was like more in like the 10k world. Um, but who, I can't do numbers are so. And that's arbitrary. tough to live off of, dude. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I never did. I yeah. I basically like early on, I started um doing wedding films, like in or wedding videos, in like I don't know, two thousand and one, maybe at the same time I was doing BMX stuff because interesting. There was no money in BMX, and I, and I knew that, and I'd love to do it, and I just wanted to do it to make the make the films. Like that yes. was it. Yeah. And so my idea was like, well, what can I do that doesn't matter? Like I just someone will pay me to film stuff. And so I started making these like wedding videos, um, had no idea what I was doing, but people don't care. There's no like prerequisite to be like film a wedding, you know, right. just, yeah. I have a camera and, and you get a few demos. I had, I think Byron Anderson, we were roommates for a while. And so his sister was getting married and he's like, why don't you film her wedding? I'll give you one month free rent. If you film her wedding, and I was like sick. It's like $400. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> Ballin. So that was your first one. So I had a, once I had a demo, I was like, great, I have a demo and like, let me just put this out there and, you know, just like hustled to get more and more and more. And so that's basically how I was making money. Like I haven't had a real job. Like I haven't had a job since 2004. I've been just full production because nice. the BMX side really didn't pay my, like the BMX videos I did and like, there wasn't really money in that. It was Passion. the other stuff I was doing that right, was making yeah. money to survive. So making yeah. wedding videos just so you can make BMX videos. I can relate to that a lot yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly so i did uh, that for like too long um and i got like wedding videos too, you mean yeah like wedding too long? Videos. okay you got way too yeah. good at it and you ran seminars teaching people how to do it i remember yep. hearing about yep. that and i was like that's fucking awesome dude like you got you yeah. went from filming in standard definition weddings like <laughs> dad cam linear timeline to creating mini short films that are like top like top of the game i think top of the game for wedding videography like you reached the pinnacle in my opinion um I'm, that's then yeah that was the hope that was the hope i mean i was i think 2000 like right when i finished let's get mystical i started traveling basically like only doing travel destination weddings so i so you sick. know i i did multiple weddings in italy and in like the maldives and in india and in I don't, I don't know, like ev everywhere, basically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at that point, I was charging people like $30,000 to shoot a wedding. So, Fuck yes, that's awesome. And that's what the, that was the problem is like, well, if they're going to pay me this much money, well, I can't say no. You yeah. Know? And it's like the cycle of like, I don't like doing it, but I'm really good at no. it. No, I'm making yeah. good money. Yeah. yeah I'm not going to say no. So I just kept doing it. And the cycle just kept repeating itself because you're booking a year in advance. So yeah. your schedule's already booked and you can't get out. Yeah. And so like, I did that for like, I don't know, too many years until I finally, I started doing more, like 2012, I started doing, I started a commercial production company and then started doing more commercials and then weaned out of the wedding side and just in the commercials and films. The delivery and men, right? Yep, correct, correct. 2012 yeah. is when that started? Yep, 2012. When did you realize that uh, the real, like cinematography world doesn't take wedding filmmakers serious? Uh, probably in... I mean, probably right at, right away, but I didn't think about it. You know, it's like, yeah. it's money. Everybody else I did yeah, was doing filmmaking real. was like, they're like, I'm going to make movies. It's like, that sounds great, but you're, you, you know, you're, you're like living like a starving artist. And then they never, no, no one I knew ever made it. You know, yeah. they then ended up getting a job eventually yeah, because they exactly. couldn't survive. So that was my mentality. I was like, I don't care. But then eventually, you know, probably 2009, 2010, I was like, well, you know, this isn't, a serious thing. I mean, even though it's like, it's extremely difficult to do, you know, yeah. you're at a live event, you're under a lot of pressure. If you mess this up, you're, you're ruining someone's <laughs> memory like forever. of forever. Yeah. It should be their, fa like their favorite event or whatever. Like I have a very different outlook on weddings because I think it's all bullshit anyway, but <laughs> um, the amount of money people waste is so fucking stupid. You could have bought yeah. a house. You could have done so many other things, but you want to have this party and Anyways, what really what was the most you charged for a wedding video at like uh, the, at the peak? It's probably I mean between thirty and forty k. I'd say that's pretty I'd great. In that world, that's yeah. fantastic. And that so I know. All right, let's talk about the Coldplay thing. Can you talk oh, about shit. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because all right, let me tell you something. Because so, I ended up working for Sabrosa, and your situation with Coldplay is the reason that they insisted that I clear every single song that we put out for Sabrosa. And I 
like thank you joe simon for getting <laughs> for getting in legal trouble because it taught me how to like reach out to artists and get music sync licensing agreements going this is like before yeah. I think maybe music libraries existed, but I didn't know about it. So I'm having these, I'm finding people on Bandcamp, having them print out a contract, sign it, take a, <laughs> take a picture and send it back for a little like bike check video, you know, it was, it was overkill, but it was a good learning experience. So anyway, yeah. Uh, so I know that you, it was a, it was a promo for a wedding. It was just like a, the teaser video that was on your Vimeo, but it went super viral and then Tell me, tell me the story. What happened? I mean, I think it was, it, it's all, it's so funny. So I, it was for Tony Romo's wedding, Dallas yeah. Cowboys quarterback. I don't even watch, like I call it sports ball. I watch no sports. Yeah, I just, sports ball. I, like the, <laughs> I call it all sports ball. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> um, so, and everybody's like, you're filming his wedding. I was like, I don't even know who this guy is. Like, who is this? <laughs> just Tony? Yeah, I like Tony. Tony. <laughs> He's a good guy. Um, so yeah, so it shot his, his wedding. Um, they're like, you, we want this song in our videos. Like, cool, great, I'll put it in there. And then, you know, I did like a highlights video and then I, um, you know, it's obviously a, you know, famous ish people and they usually don't want that on the internet. And so I emailed the, um, his, the wife, I think it was Candace was her name. I could be wrong. And I was like, Hey, do you mind if I post this, this video? She's like, Oh yeah, that's cool. No problem. I was like, Oh, rad. Okay, cool. And so like, I was in Italy at the time on another job. And so I posted it went and went to sleep. Um, and obviously since I was in Europe, the time difference, like it was like 11 PM or whatever. And so it was probably midday in the U S when I posted it. Yeah. So the next morning I wake up to like my inbox is exploding. Um, and it's like all these, her, one of them were for her being like, Hey, take the video down. Like it's, it's out of control. And I'm like, what? And like all these news networks he emailed, like we oh, license no the footage, shit. we license the footage, like, and then it was like blasted everywhere on ESPN and like every sports network, all the news channels were like playing snippets of it. Wow. Um, without my permission ever yeah. happened, you know, I never gave my permission. So like I pulled it down, but at that point it was too late because once it's on the internet, it, it's hard to it's strip something off the internet. It's right. everywhere. Yeah. And so I don't even think Coldplay even knew the video existed. It's just their manager or management or whoever got wind of it, then came to sue me for using it. Um, and you know, it's not like, you know, Tony and those people had to deal with this. Like I had to deal with it. Um, and I had to end up paying like out of court, like a, a fee, you know, which Five figures. was more, which was more than I, than I made from the whole, the whole wedding video to begin with, you know, so this yeah. is so stupid. Yeah. So are you allowed to talk about it at this point? I remember, so I, I, have listened, no idea. I listened to your 2000. It's probably still an NDA. Podcast. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we won't go too far, but yeah, I, in the, uh, in the interview you wrote out like, well, I can't t say much, but it's X, 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 X amount of dollars. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> so, too much. It was yeah. too much. That's a, but also I think, and at that time too, it's not like I was making a lot of money. So to me that like, that was a, like, that was a lot of money. I was like, fuck you know like yeah it's did, you know did you have to pay it all at in one in one check or did you do set up yeah. like a payment plan type thing no i was paid in one in one check at that point um but something i did realize later that i you know i didn't know now i should have gotten legal counsel to to help me figure it out because i did have insurance and my insurance at that time probably would have covered it huh. because if you have if you have liability insurance for your company that's one of those things that's part of your liability insurance is, um, uh, I can't remember the exact legal term for it, but it, it would, it covers things like that where you miss, you know, you, you use something that's out of license or whatever. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, dude. That's so I had, so had cool. it happen to, yeah. I had it happen to another friend and he just uses insurance. I was like, you motherfucker. <laughs> I wish I knew that. Yeah, for real. They probably settled for less because the insurance fights them about it. And then they come to a smaller mm -hmm. number. So yeah. that's amazing. And you, you've literally just learned everything through trial and error. Like you're just like, I'm going to do this yeah. and then figure it out. How, like fake it till you make it type thing. What was your, uh, first like time where you're on a big set, like a pro like a full blown production where they're using all the jargon of like, at, I've been on a, you know, a, pr a proper production set and I was overwhelmed with all these words that they're using and just like, it's like their own in inner lingo. It's like a cool kids club of just like say yeah. this. I still can't remember it. I shot one that, and that aired on A&E. A &E. I assembled a little skeleton crew and I was asking my lighting guy, like, okay, so what do I say before we do the slate? <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it's all it's. What was your first time on a production set, and how did it feel faking it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I still fake it. I think it, everybody continually fakes it because no one really knows what they're doing yep. for all of eternity. So it, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, I, I can't remember the first time, but I, I remember the first time being like a bigger, like a bigger set where it was, I think it was shooting like um, some like kind of, uh, what do you call it? Um, washing machine soap or something like that. Something really stupid. Um, but it had to do with like, uh, you know, we're filming like people in the backyard running around playing and they have all these big lights and, you know, I'm, I'm DPing it. Um, but it's, I, I think at that point it's like my first really big DP gig. Um, yeah. so I remember walking to the backyard and like having so much anxiety and almost having a panic attack because I was like, there's 50, 60 people here and yeah. I have, you know, a large crew that I'm responsible for and they're looking at me for information. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, yeah. you know? So <laughs> I just remember like being super stressed out and like having to go walk around the corner and just like breathe for a minute and be like, it's just another day. It's, it's fine. And just another back day. In and then just make it happen. Yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a daylight, daylight backyard scene where they're using like big, big diffusions and the super mega powerful lights and all that shit. Like, yeah, it was, it was a whole thing. We had interior, exterior. We had a bunch of stuff. We had, you know, HMI. It basically, HMI lights are the bigger uh, daylight balance lights that they'll put outside. And, you know, 12, 12 by is like 12 foot by 12 foot, you know, squares right. of diffusion or balance. And like that stuff's everywhere. It wasn't there yet, but, you know, I talked to my gaffer who's in control of lighting and then my key grip who's kind of, he's in control of like setting up the, the gear as far as like the frames and the stands and any kind of rigging. Yeah. And I talk to those guys and nowadays I can communicate very well with them because I know the lingo and I know, you know, what I, I generally want. Yeah. And, you know, and I get their recommendations as well. Back then I was like, uh, I don't know, put a light here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow you made it like, through, This man. guy's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. How, how did the, uh, the delivery men, is that the, am I saying it right? The delivery yep. men, how did that begin? just started because um, I, I think when I first, just because I didn't really know what I was doing in general, I always thought you just start a company. That's how you do things. And um, when I had my, when I was doing the weddings videos, I had a Joe Simon Productions was, was like my production company. So when I started doing commercials, I thought, well, I need to start a production company, right? That's the only way to do it. Um, instead of just being like, oh, I could be freelance and just start working with established production companies and do it that way. Um, so in 2012, I just did that to be like, here's my branch of commercial production. Nice. Um, and cause it's weird, like as a, um, as a DP, you know, director of photography, it's not normal to own a production company. Um, because you know, a, normally a director or producer would own a production company because they're the one that will be interfacing with the clients or the agency that would be winning work and you know, all that. So, right. I didn't really, I think at that point, understand the different crew levels, you know, cause I, I was basically directing and DPing everything at that point. Yeah. So cause you me, came from like, BMX just, one man yeah, army. It's like you do it all. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They call, and, and then, and you know, in the world, they call that predators, which is like a, a producer editor, which basically you do everything, ah, it's like, you know? Yeah. They're like, sick. They'll have calls back. Oh, we're looking for a predator and like, okay, we just want you to go out and film this stuff and then you edit and then you send it to us. And like, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's me currently. I'm, I'm, I'm a predator at this point. You just do it all. I mean, but it's, yeah. it's great to know, like the experience of learning every aspect of filmmaking is, is important because then you understand when you get into bigger productions, like, okay, I know how this will edit together. I understand this shot will work with the next shot right. you know, versus there's some DPs that don't understand the editing process at all, like really big DPs. And so they're focused on one shot, you know, like that's, that's their focus. And then it's like, okay, what's the next shot? Yeah. But it's like, will those actually connect? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know. Have you done every role on set at this point? Like, have, were you doing, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, did you do one off, one off gigs as a key grip or as a gaffer and on, no. on set type type thing? No, I never did that. I basically, cause I, since I came, up like doing the production company part of it um you know the company is now cut it's tdm now i'm um, just shortened but it, it's basically i was directing and DPing pretty much every project um i had a staff for a while i had a, a producer on staff for a while and then i had another editor full-time on staff and so we just get jobs and you know we'd write 
write um you know write the spots write the commercials whatever it was and then we'd produce it and then we'd go out and shoot and direct it and then come back and my editors would edit it and then we you know do the next one so I did that for long enough where i had enough experience that you know it started as like two three person crews but through the production company it started getting bigger and bigger where then i was like hiring gaffers and so, key grips and then like for a while i didn't have an like, assistant camera like you know the first ac his, his first assistant camera is the person that pulls focus and they're also the person that like sets your whole camera up and and you know make sure the lenses are working properly and all the gears working properly um and it's like something that when you're just doing all yourself you don't even think about it. like you're pulling yeah. focus yourself and you're like you're doing all that but now it's like i can't imagine pulling my own focus like it seems crazy to me really because it's uh, yeah it's just because it's one more thing you're thinking about instead of focusing on your composition you know yep. or or fo focusing on like the way the camera will move or like the lighting in the back or like whatever there's so many other details to focus on in the frame aside that, from pulling focus right yeah. yeah that makes sense you know it's like nowadays i have you know first ac and a second ac so i have two camera assistants and the day before the shoot they prep all the gear get everything ready and they show up the next day on set and the camera's built it's all ready and i said you know i work like put the tribe you know put the six over here put the camera on and like it all gets set up, you know, yeah. and I'm working with the director to get the shot set up and figure things out with my lighting team because it's just too much responsibility that you can't, you can't do all that. You know, you have to delegate and, and be able to work as a team to, to create the content. Yeah. And yeah. it's specialization. And then the yeah. more, the higher level, the more people you can have who are specialized at their own thing. And then you come up with something magical, like just scrolling through your Instagram and seeing stills from your shots or your, your, projects it's it's incredible and there is like thank you it's crazy the gap between just like kind of winging it and making content like i'm doing like just like nowhere near the the gap between where i'm at making cool little skits to where you're at is unbelievable um do you remember your first like big client that you got with tdm and like when mm. the one where you were like oh shit this this can be a thing i'm gonna do this you know I mean, I think we did we did um, uh, a couple cool like car to go spots back in the day, which I remember that being like a pretty big deal. Um, I don't think it's a company anymore, but <laughs> for a while it was. <laughs> okay. um, and then there was another we did this doc series um, for a company called Mauser. There's like a giant like if you do electronics, it's like this place where if you're like, oh, I need to solder together some boards or whatever, like you would order all your stuff from this company. It's like a huge like um electronics brand but they had a um, um they had this guy oh my god i can't remember his name i think it's um grant imahara he was like one of the guys on mythbusters and he was like their like face of the brand and so we got hired to make um a four-part documentary series you know like three four minute documentaries but it was like a huge like a, it was like a you know huge deal as far as like how much money they're they're funding for the project and we're going to go to like tokyo and we're going to germany and like all these other places Sick. to film these like docks yeah and so it, that was probably our, our first really big one where i was like oh man this is you know our whole summer is just this project and we're gonna amazing for like locations and we're responsible for finding the, the crews and getting the permits over there and like getting fixers like all the stuff you have to do when you go overseas which is pretty crazy and that um, stuff, those those details are handled by the producer. Am I right? Correct. Cool. Yep, correct. But being that it's my production company and I have an in-house producer, it's like I'm I'm the I'm the executive producer of everything, which is basically like I oversee everything and make sure like if it if it goes wrong, it's my fault because I didn't yeah. make sure that it was done right. So not only am I like directing and DPing and I'm also like executive producing. So it was definitely a big learning experience, but you know, it was like we pulled it off. You know, and the clients were happy, and we did it for another year after that. So we had two years of that with those guys. So nice, was, yeah, and then it was a lot of fun. so it's a production company, and then you only got to get, you know, a couple of really good paying big projects for the year, and you're kind of set. But what the first year of the delivery man, and you you don't have to answer this, but I'm I'm always curious, like what how much net net revenue did you bring in for TDM on in your first first year? probably not much the first year i feel like the first to me it was almost like i was weaning Mate, myself out i of said the i said net but i meant the gross. other one gross yeah the first i think the first couple years it was like only a couple projects it was like doing weddings and then doing a, a, one or two commercials and the next year was like oh we'll do four or five and then it was like six or seven so it kind of like 
slowly transition instead of just being like stop and like change over. Yeah. Cause I didn't think that was gonna be a good way of business because building a production company takes time. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, first we probably didn't make that much, you know, I think mm, maybe a hundred thousand for the year or something like that, maybe the first year, you that's, know, and then like it started like building up from there. That's um, great. Yeah. It, that's, it's, it just, you know, like commercial, it's crazy. People waste so much money making commercials, you know, it's just like the industry yeah. is, um, and say, I mean, com- most of the commercials you see on TV are, you know, easily, you know, 500 to a couple, 500,000 to a couple million dollars, you know, Sheesh. for every single one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> we, uh, so I work, this plaque on the wall is for a company called New Reach and they have education courses and, uh, the stars that they have have a show on A&E called Triple Digit Flip, and we wanted to run a commercial during the premiere of their show, and we were shopping around production companies in Arizona, getting the lowest the lowest bid that we got was like $20,000, and I was like, I think I could do it for for five grand, and I took five grand, and I made two two commercials that aired on A&E, and just... Learn, yeah. I learned so fucking much about, you know, all the things I did wrong and all the, like the jargon and stuff. And if you put me on a set right now, I'd be so intimidated, dude, but <laughs> that's no. how you do it. You got to learn. I mean, but that's also yeah. the thing is like, you do it for a while, like you do it on the cheap for a bit. And then you like, realize like, man, I'm really killing myself f- for what these people think is they're all, they're also saying like your client's like, Oh man, this is so cheap. This is great. We can use all this money for something else instead of like paying the actual price that it should cost. That yeah, they know what exactly. it should cost, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's why so, like, that's always the thing. But yeah, I mean, production is crazy. I mean, nowadays we do, my production company does less stuff. Um, so my, um, wife, Katie, she quit her corporate job three years ago now. And so she works with the company, it's basically just me and her. Uh, she also does pottery. It's kind of like her, her two things. She produces and does pottery. Um, but we only do, I don't know, three or four, you know, projects a year. And the rest of the time I'm, big, I'm freelancing. Cause to me, it's, um, you know, being a director of photography, I want to do like really big projects and I don't want to be producing those through my production company because usually the size of them is just limiting to what I could actually do here you know, versus being freelance, I'm working with other production companies that, you know, they're doing, you know, you know, $500,000, million dollar jobs right, yeah. that I can then just DP and I get to focus just on the creative side of that and not have to worry about like crafty and what the PA is doing and, you know, what are, what the client thinks, because like, that's not my problem. My problem is like, what does the director want? You know, how do I create that vision? Yeah. And, like, that's it. And then when I'm done with the project, I walk away and it's like, I'm done. I'm not like, I hope they don't mess it up in post because they usually do. Like they yeah. always like to ruin things in post. That's not, it's not my problem. You know, I'm like just there yeah. to focus on that vision at that point. So what's a conversation like if you're on a set and you're the DP that they bring in, you know, hotshot Joe Simon's here. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the, like to figure out the vision from the director, what does that conversation sound like? Just for Give me an example. Yeah. I mean, it, it starts pretty early usually. I mean, you're, you know, a few weeks before the shoot to a week before the shoot, you know, you're working, you know, doing zoom calls or in person and, and looking at images and mood boards and the script and talking through the shots. And, you know, they'll, that person will send me over, ask me like, what do you think the mood is? And show me some references of, of looks, both with like, um, angles of camera, what the lighting would look like, you know, how much contrast do we have, uh, as well as like video examples, like show me some videos that have similar vibes of what you're trying to create. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll look at the script, break down the script with the shot list. And those shot lists will break down like it's a, you know, a medium shot that's going to be on Dolly and, you know, you know, whatever that's going to be. And so we build all that stuff before we actually go to set. And then we'll scout a few days before the shoot where we actually go to location. And then we actually look at the, the space and see where the light falls and, and the gaffer and the key gripper there, the production designer there, like everybody's there. And we're all building this world together. Um, on the scout and then we get to the shoot and actually start shooting it. So it's so it's much like planning, very long, so process, much yeah. planning. Yeah. Uh, so I saw on your Instagram, you broke down, um, and a really interesting one is a short film and a laundromat. And I don't know the gist, but the character is like slowly going crazy. And at the beginning of the short film, it's all on sticks, tripod, 
still shots. And then as the film progresses, it gets more handheld and crazy. And I, I was like, I love that. That's so sick. That's, that's DP type shit, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's all, it's all part of it. Cause you're constantly thinking about, you know, like is the angle of the camera, you know, like how is that affecting what the viewer feels subconsciously, right. you know, how does the camera move? And then also how does the light fall? So, you know, and, and you can use many different styles for different feelings, you know, but it's how you combine them for each shot that helps drive that. And yeah. so I think that's, it's a lot of fun, especially when you do, you know, I do a lot of um, short films every year. And, and part of that is, you know, you're able to tell a story with the camera very specifically. And it's so yeah. much more fun to be able to do that instead of like commercials are just, how do you make this look cool? And what can we do to, you know, to sell the product, you know, whatever right. that could be. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like, oh, exciting movement or like, we need to make this bright and happy because everybody's smiling, whatever it is. It's not bright and happy specifically like, yeah. yeah, it's not specifically tapping into a, an emotion for a reason. That's never, not often that it's darker, you know, like I like thrillers and I like dark comedies and, and things that are more in that space. Yeah. So it's, it's fun to kind of work in that world. In That's dope. Side. When you mentioned horror, it brought me right back to The Calling in 2005. Yeah. And there's a couple of things that I do want to go back and talk about. So like, yeah, um, and I, what was your answer for uh, the, like the writing that you're most proud of this, the section? Did you answer that? Like, no, I don't think I, I think my, my probably subvert my subversion section which is 2000, that's a mutiny video in 2002 or three, I think. Um, that's that's your, a really great, your best really writing? great section. Yeah, I don't know if that's on the internet either. Um, <laughs> great film. Yeah. I think what happened was once I got, once the Coldplay thing happened, um, Gaz and I were doing mutiny at that point. We, we pulled down all the videos because it was like, oh, oh shit, we're going to start getting sued for these. Because I was like, my name's attached to it. And then like, yeah, they start they're digging like into coming that. after you. Yeah. But I think everything got erased. I still have it all. I need to re upload stuff. Um, yeah. But that subversion section is really great. A lot of big rails, gap to rails, you know, backwards rails, a lot of, you know, crank arm grinds and pedal grinds back then that I was really doing a lot of um, that, that were really cool. Yeah, I think you were doing crank arms ahead of your time for sure. Yeah, I was one of my favorite things back then to do. Um, actually, I'll upload that section of my YouTube page later today. Hell yeah, I'd love that. Yeah. So, um, and, then, and then I think uh, in the calling, I like that section as well. The, call, the calling was fun. Um, I think it was like not as aggressive as my earlier writing, though. At that point, you know, I think it was it, uh, later on in the in the years, being that it was two thousand five. Um, I think it's funny too because I didn't really I rode so much trails but I never filmed trail footage. So I was like, why film trail footage? It's so stupid. So I just <laughs> would <to> film street. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like I did a, a, a wall ride to opposite two seventy out. I think at the end of that, that was like a really sick. Uh, it just felt it just felt really nice, you know. On a flat wall or a curve wall? Curve wall, curve yeah. wall. Ride, yeah, yeah. It's the like, famous famous brick one that's in Texas. Or no. It's a different. It's one of the famous ones. Uh, Paul, Paul Buchanan has a bunch has a bunch of shots on that one. The one that's in the calling at the very end. But in Subversion, um, I do the one eighty curve wall ride there that I did a um, wall ride to to hard one eighty out, um, which was like at, back in that time. I was like, that's like amazing. I was like, holy fuck! I can't believe I did that. You can ride around a yeah. curve wall. This is so crazy. And I also did the curve wall there was a 91 that i rode up and then did a did an ice bonk on the top of it which was just like a eight foot tall wall you sick know? yeah like, dude curved wall is one of those things that like to the layman or just a normal person they're like holy shit you know you can ride your bike on the wall that's amazing <laughs> how's that possible well, yeah it'll never get old i mean curved back wall. then it was just i mean no like i remember i can't remember who was the first person to start doing it i don't know if it was like taj or um someone else there's, i actually did like that um wall there's a really awesome picture that i can't get a hold of but it was that 90 degree one i think taj did it first like he hit it and like did a tabletop out of it and i was like dude that's fucking sick i want to do it so i went back and did the same thing um but i think because people were like oh fuck joe simon i can't believe he did the same thing taj did just like <laughs> got, put, got this like taj is incredible obviously yeah and i was like i was like i want to do that it looks fun so i think someone took i think who did it? Uh, mark losey took the picture yeah um 
never have seen it. <laughs> but I saw it in the back of the camera. I was like a, two feet out of the top of the wall. That's sick. <laughs> and it looked fucking ridiculous, but never saw the light of day. Shit. Well, that's what you get for trying to ABD yeah. Taj. Yeah, you know, I wasn't trying to. I was just having my own fun, you know. You know yeah, how it is. I know. I, I love that. I think that uh, it's crazy how, how negative things get so quickly when people are like, oh, you're trying to one-up somebody? And it's just like, I'm yeah. just trying to have fun on my bike and just you That's know, the spirit. see what I can do. Yeah. I can't imagine you like worried about any BMX rules or etiquette or not maybe etiquette, but rules. Yeah, like, you don't want to be a dickhead. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't be a dick. Don't like one, one rule that I like is if you're on a trip and somebody, your teammates trying something on a rail, don't go and do the thing that he's trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's how you do it, man. And go, go do it. Um, that was that's always the problem yeah. when you're riding with people that are way better than you are and you're yeah. like oh, well, hang, hang well out here guys here. For, yeah <laughs> hang out here guys for a half hour while i try this very easy for you guys to do trick but it's me doing it so yeah uh do you prefer riding with a group of homies or one-on-one -on -one missions with the filmer um or at least back in the day when great. you were yeah i was like man back in the day i think I always enjoyed the group trips, you know, because people get hyped, you know, you're like one person does something and then you're like, oh, shit, that was sick. Yeah. Let me, you know, let me do something. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot. We had, man, we had a lot of, a lot of great trips with people. You know? Yeah. I think like, I remember um, that subversion video. I mean, it, we had some great road trips and like, I had a really shitty Honda, like 80s Honda Civic that was like such a piece of shit. <laughs> we drove up from Texas to LA and um, Neil Harrington was with me gaz was with me and um i think one one other person i'm forgetting who was also there we we you know that was the trip that i don't know if you remember the subversion section with neil harrington i think i watched it uh no um, if it's not online i didn't watch it but i just watched something where you you and neil harrington were in it together and more more people too one blonde dude and you i think somebody did a crank arm neil harrington did something super tech and i was like oh that's classic neil um i don't yeah. know if it's the subversion video or not but it was it was a version we went, we went to the moore park high school or college you know i actually yeah. grew up so i grew up in simi valley which is like next door to moore park um you know the school i'm talking about they had like all those low rails I don't think it's there anymore, um, but it had these like low rails that were just like insane. And um, Neil did a an alley oop backwards rail down the stairs, and I'm pretty sure it was the first one ever that's, done. That's yeah, at that's that point. nuts. Yeah, um, and whatever two thousand two or three when that happened. Yeah, you know, he also did like a hand plant over a rail somewhere. Yeah, down know, a set. Down I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, then that's totally the video I watched because I remember the hand plant down one hand plant one eighty down a rail down a proper yeah. set right that's yeah. so crazy yeah. neil was like, one of those dudes way ahead of his time as well yeah he did you crazy. still you stay in touch with him what's yeah what's his, I, uh what's we chat on the instagram you know every so often but he lives yeah. in houston so i haven't seen him in, in quite some time but Word. yeah do you stay Keep in touch with that. any of the uh the dudes you used to ride with like sure or ronnie or um yeah all those dudes we will text every so often um i talked to alistair witten a bit on on just text as well so yeah those dudes it's just not as much it's just so busy i think that's yeah. the biggest thing it's like i travel probably i don't know 250 days out of the year i'm out of town damn so i'm like that's constantly crazy. on the road yeah, yeah. what so was the most recent place that you went um i did <laughs> i just did like a back to back to back trip i was in um hawaii i was in kona shooting a yeti commercial and then i went straight from there to steamboat on the same commercial and then i came home for a day and went to costa rica would you say steam, a, a steamboat steamboat colorado okay gotcha steamboat and springs then? and then i went home for a day to swap out clothes and then flew to costa rica for a week and then flew to nashville straight from there for another shoot wow so all for like, tdm or just doing uh, no it was all freelance all sick, freelance work sick. well costa rica was a vacation i had planned just to go surfing for a week so i went down there to surf nice took a surfing break then flew back to nashville back to for work. the next shoot yeah you're and living I, the dream life man i got i got home i got home about a week ago and it's been like uh i, I had a, i was supposed to go to paris for a shoot but i but that didn't happen so now i'm just waiting for the next thing or just relaxing heading to christmas yeah yeah, trying to catch up on yeah. life. Yeah, happy holidays, my dude. That's yeah, awesome. You too, man. <laughs> so another thing that I wanted to get back to, so post BMX, 
you kind of are dominating weddings and then you what tell me about these wedding seminars like oh yeah were you making because like i work for guys who teach people how to wholesale real estate and how to invest in real estate creative financing and stuff like that and there's big money in education and i'm yeah i'm wondering if that was big money for you doing some wedding seminars like wedding so your wedding filmmakers would pay to come and learn from you for a couple of days is that is that the gist yeah i mean it was it was it was decent money i think um at the point is basically at you know the high to my i guess wedding film days and so people are trying to learn the techniques like how do you do this what's the you know what's the one on one on one on like how to make this work yeah um and so it'd be a mixture of some i'd go speak at conferences like i've done I, like I do a conference usually where I speak for an hour and then I'd also have a workshop, like a one or two day workshop on the side, the same thing that so I'd get paid to do the conference and I'd do like, you know, it's $2,000 a person to come to this workshop. You know, what do you do at a workshop? Do just hands on. It's like, you know, this is back with the glide cam days. This is before yeah. gimbals at this point, but as you know, you know, this is how you set it up. This is how you operate it. Here's some, some tricks that I use, you know, then go into basically everything. It's like, this is how I prepare. This is like pre-production, how you should work with your clients. Here's how to get more clients. Here's how to do it in post. Like this is basically a run through of like creation of a wedding video. Yeah, that's great. You know, front to back. I still um, have a little urge to make a wedding video. What would you, how do you take it from the chronological montage that I've done? I shot Brian Kaczynski's wedding, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was, that was fun. But it's just, you know. Shout out to Brian. Shout out to Brian Kaczynski, nicest man on the planet super nice um, dude <clears throat> uh but it is it's just like the same formula just like document the day make sure you have good audio of the people talking at the thing but how do you take it from that type of wedding video to what you ended up doing making short films with you know like you're scheduling shooting with the couple prior to or after what's what's give me give me a little workshop joe like a yeah, five, uh, five minute workshop I'm like if I can even remember what I did back then. It's also weird because I think that at the beginning, no one will give you the time of day to do anything creative, you know? And it's also you're working with a photographer and usually the photographer's in control. So the person doing video, it's like you're kind of like- Just tag along. Second, second hand of like, yeah, you just be quiet and stay back there and like, yeah. you know, maybe you get a chance to do your own directing if you want. So yeah. I think it took a while to like steal enough shots where maybe the photographer was directing and I'd do some like moving shots of, you know, them walking or whatever to try to like create these montages. Um, but is, you know, for the most part, it was like, how do you, you know, how do you just be a fly on the wall and, and in when they're getting ready, like get cool shots that you can then use to like build a story of some sort. And like, is there like a letter that's being given that will help tie together a story and like, be like, Oh, the groom wrote her this like wonderful letter and then I, she reads it and she cries and it's like, Oh, can you read it out loud to me so I can just record the audio of it and we can like yes. place it over the video. It's like just stuff like that, you know? Right. And then once I kind of built, you know, or not built, but like once I shot a couple of weddings that were like big money, because it's like, that's the thing is like, if, if the wedding's at like the YMCA, and the decorations are are shit and and the people don't look that great like whatever else like it's it's all bullshit but like this is what it is then yeah it's not gonna look that good it's all production design it's the same thing with the way movies are made it's like if your location's great your production designer i.e the wedding coordinator like they spend a hundred thousand dollars on decorations and cakes and like the venue and the view and like all the stuff it's it's built in production like yeah you know like you have it looks incredible it's like not that hard to, to shoot it at that point, right you know yeah and that's like the cheat is like once i did a couple that were like mediocre i was able to get the more expensive ones and the, they just had better stuff to point the camera at and they yeah. had better looking couples exactly. and then the people started trusting me more and be like i just need 15 minutes after the wedding to like film you two walking together and like kissing and like whatever other bullshit i needed to like make the sequence nice and it's like only a three minute to five minute highlight video is not that hard to create from an entire day of filming, you know? Yeah. If, if it was an hour long, it would be so hard. Like, it would be boring, you know? Yeah. But I think real. that was the key. It was short. It was expensive wedding, so everything looked good already. Yeah. And that's that's the cheat. So what <laughs> did you... When, like, one of my favorite parts of being a freelance 
video company is the negotiation, the talking with the client, telling them what they need or telling like figuring out what they need, asking the right questions and all that. And I'm kind of forgetting where I'm going with this question, but, uh, negotiating. Yeah. Well, no, like when you're talking to the couple are, yeah, fuck, I forgot my, my, my train, my, my train, train of thought went away. Um, yeah forget about it i i know no. then i know the next question um let's get mystical what were you shooting what what was your gear for that do you remember oh man let's see so i'm gonna adjust my mic here yeah yes here we go now this, this is just something i haven't i haven't used this mic in a long time hopefully this <laughs> sounds right um it's a good looking mic it sounds let's good get miss mystical. yeah look at this like just like I don't even know what you're a broadcaster. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Um, <laughs> let's get mystical. All right. We were so let's let's get mystical was right when the 5D came out. Okay. Um, so I remember getting that camera and obviously it was a huge game changer just because it went from everything's in focus to like I have depth of field control now, you know? Yeah. Um, although you were locked at like 30p at that point and it was like a lot of just n- not noise in the image. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Aliasing. See, like all like the little lines that you see, like on the buildings, all like moving. Yeah. And just what is that called? Aliasing. Aliasing. Okay. Yeah. So um, I got the 5D. So I think it was a mix of the 5D and the HVX um, were the two cameras. HVX Interesting. 200, yeah. 200, 200. Was that what that camera was called? That was like the first Panasonic HD camera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was those two cameras basically. And um, yeah, man, it was that was a lot of fun making that film. Cause it was just like, let's, we did a bunch of road trips and each section was based on locations, you know, it wasn't by parts. Yeah. So it was like, there was a Texas section. There was like a Canada section. There was a Europe section. So yeah, it was a lot of fun, like creating that. So then you can keep the essence of trip, like that trip, you know, fun together and like build a story around that, you know, and then like yeah. how every trip's a little bit different, you know, like how much partying are you doing? And like, what kind of antics do you get into and like, you know, trying to keep some of that into there. So it just wasn't like just trick porn all the way through, yes. um, you know, it is nice. I mean, I love a, a person having a section because then it shows the work that they put in to create all of that. Um, but I think our idea going into is like, let's just make this a, a story about multiple trips, you know, throughout the year. Yeah. yeah. What was it like uh, working with Randy Taylor? Dude, Randy was awesome. He just, super gifted person you know it's just like yeah it was always so funny too because he'd be like man i don't want to i don't want to do this i'm just you know i'm just chilling today and then like you turn around for a second he'd be like tail whipping down like a 15 stare like, yeah god damn it Let me <laughs> i get thought you were chilling out. man <laughs> yeah I, like, here's one of those guys you know just like yeah. damn like just so effortlessly to, to do everything you know yeah um such a rad dude man it's 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 sad sad to see people you know that have have life you know, have life so rough that, you know, they don't really have a way out. Yeah. Um, like, like he does. And, and many other people in BMX, I think it's, uh, I think extreme sports in general, you know, it's, it's, it's an escape for a lot of people, you know, that 100%. it's like your family life is shit. You, you know, you got to deal with too much. It's like, let me go out, ride my bike. And, and, and that's like a whole new world that, that opens up. Yeah. Um, but you still have to go home. You know, I think that's, that's what's tough is some people yeah. can't ever escape it. Were you close with Randy? Like, what was what was his life like? Um, I mean, I wasn't super close with him because he lived in uh, Fort Worth. So, you know, it's three hours from Austin. So I kind of just saw him on trips. And every so often, he'd come down and sleep on the floor at the house uh, or at Gaz's place. So uh hung out a bit, but mostly on trips. Yeah, yeah. not super, super close. But he's um, stu- he's like a really chill dude, you know, like pretty mellow, liked to party, you know, like, like many of us did. Um, yeah. But he was just, I don't know, it's like there's certain people that are just gifted, like the way that they can ride a bike so effortlessly and also look so good when they do it. Right. You know? Yeah. And like he he just, I don't know, jumps off 20 stairs and it looks like he jumped down two stairs the way that he right, can land. Yeah. And you're just like, how do you do that? Like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> His infamous tail whip down that big ass set. I, I know I can see it in my brain forever. He's a mystical guy. What, like, yeah. if you had to choose one, does, does any specific clip that you filmed of him stick out in your mind like what's your what's a good memory you have of working with randy taylor man it's a tough one um i think 
we filmed a bunch in Austin. I think we always had a great time doing that. Um, I remember, I don't know, just like so many nose wheelie shots of him. Yeah. Just, you know, he just, there's a, one of the train tracks, uh, this train station they're building here in Austin. And I remember it was, I don't know, it was probably 30, 40 foot long, like bunny hop up three feet or so into a nose wheelie across the whole thing. And it was just like, <laughs> what? It's incredible. We're filming that, like, yeah. and like the curve, uh, the curved ledge here in Austin, the same thing. Like, it's just like, you're going to nose me yes. around this? All right, dude. All right, let's see that. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> those few tricks were just, you know, to me, it was so mind blowing to see. He was definitely ahead of his time on the nose wheelies. He was easily one of the most influential riders of the, what are they? They call them the aughts. The, the 2000s. Aughts. <laughs> yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? The 2000s. Yeah. yeah. Man, it's wild. Yeah. He was, <clears> he was a good dude. I wish I had, I wish I spent more time with him. I think like at that point, I was, you know, uh, the only time I was really in BMX was like mostly filming at that point, you know, cause I was like filming the videos or like I was out filming weddings and doing other stuff at the same time. So yes. Yeah. You've been a busy boy. <laughs> crazy times. I'm very, I'm very self-motivated. That's so. what's up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of those kind of people. Yeah. Rest in peace, Randy Taylor, man. That's, yeah, man. Um, what are your like goals right now? What, what's, what's the future look like for Joe Simon? Do you have that? Like, throughout your career have you had that kind of like in your mind or you just kind of go with the flow and take opportunities as they come do you are you a five-year plan type of guy or the opposite of that no i mean i'm 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 not really great at making goals it's a lot of you know this is like i want to do like right now it's like i want to be doing more feature films so that's that's a goal of mine so it's it's seeking out ways to to do that but it's not it's hard to put a time on on a goal because I think in especially in the filmmaking world it's it could be ten years, you know, it could be fifteen yeah. years. It's a slow, it's a very slow process because you're not dealing with yourself as much as you're dealing with the rest of the world giving you an opportunity to to do that thing. Right. Um so it's a little bit different. But no, I mean I kind of i I'm really a go with the flow kind of person because different opportunities present themselves and you say yes or you say no, you know. And I think it's like this year I did two feature documentaries um, back to back, basically at the beginning of the year. And, um, you know, I, I basically went from February all the way to July shooting those two projects. And it was just like, well, it's an opportunity. Like, let's, let's go down this, this rabbit hole and see what happens. So, nice. um, you know, so I took, I didn't do any commercials for, I think almost six or seven months. It's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. Are you do doing, that. are you doing any editing or are you a bit, Pass a bit. That off. I, yeah no i mean i do i think it's hard because i think that um I, since i came up doing it and i have a very specific style um in the way that i edit especially with the way i shoot footage and then edit footage Pas- like my passion projects i will edit my own yeah that uh, makes my sense own, my own stuff because i just think that it just turns out better than if someone else was to do it yeah um most commercials and stuff i just pass off because i don't really want to it's not worth the it's not worth like the yeah the, the, the effort to do it um, exactly yeah but it, I do I mean I'm I'm definitely like that person I look back at my work which just kind of sucks sometimes like I'll look at my work and be like my favorite things are the ones that I also edited <laughs> like yeah. I, I don't know what that says <laughs> no it's tough to pass off yeah. editing man I have to like I'm learning it myself right now because I'm managing a media team for my client and it's just like. I, yeah, you got. I just got to accept some of the mistakes and some of the shit that you know I would have done differently, and just be like, yeah, it's good. Let's post it. You know, it, it's yeah. a relinquishing control is a hard thing to do, especially when you know you have the vision and you're like, I shot, I shot it. I have a vision of how it goes together, but I pass it off, and then you know, that's yeah, you just got to let it's it tough. ride. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I don't, I don't really edit like anything commercially. I I don't edit. Um, most films I don't edit because there's, there's incredible editors out there. Right. And they do yeah, a great job. Exactly. Like the incredible people that w- could do a way better job than I can. But I think it's also a lot of times the people that end up with the work I do are not maybe the best editors, you know? So yeah. it's, it's, I think that's where you kind of like also have to let go of like, well, it's also not my vision. It's that client's vision or director's vision. And so they're the one that's dictating what it is, not me. So, yeah. yeah. What was the biggest learning curve when you're getting into this professional realm of, filming or filmmaking like 
color mm-hmm. grading. I, I remember for me, it was like shooting flat and color grading. I was like, holy shit, this is a whole <laughs> new world. <dude."> that's hard. <laughs> like, yeah, that's next level shit. And you don't, you don't know what you don't know until you see somebody actually like tweaking it like super manually on all the circles. And the, I, I can't say I can color grade. I can like take flat footage and make it look decent, but I, I'm not a color grader. You know, that's a whole, yeah, yeah. whole another ball game. Can you do that? It's yeah, I can I can color grade up, but I'm not. I mean, at one point I thought I was the best. I was like, man, I'm so fucking good at this. And then yeah, you know, it's like anything. It's like when you're just at the at the entry ish level and you learn enough where you think you have power. You're like, oh man, this is really good. And then then you just take another year on your life. And you're like, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and there's or, a term for that. It's like a dumb. Yeah. There's a there's a graph of like you think yeah, you know is. everything, and then you realize how much you don't actually know. But that's I, that's all of filmmaking. Yeah, that's all. That's, every, that's life, man. <laughs> and I used to think, I remember, I don't even know, when I first started my production company, I was like, I know fucking everything. This is great. It's like, I can't believe these people aren't hiring me. I know what I'm doing. I'm the, like the smartest. And like, yeah. I, looking back, I'm like, I'm an idiot. I have no idea what I'm doing. I remember one, at, at one point, I'll get to your question, but one point I remember, you know, it's like directing, when you're directing a commercial and you're hired, like I direct some stuff, I DP some stuff, I kind of go back and forth. When you're directing a commercial, you're like basically a hired gun. And the client says, like, this is our idea. We want you to, to, to make this into reality. And you're like, okay, cool. And you like give them some of your ideas and they say yes or no. But ultimately, you're just a hired gun. Like, it's not for you to make those decisions at the end right. of the day. And yeah. I remember like going into a meeting, but like, we were like having a discussion. And like, my idea is like, what do you do? I'm, I'm the director. I can do whatever I want. Like, I'm the director. I'm like, don't you understand how this works? Like, when I'm back in my younger years, like, I think back to that, like, meeting, like, I'm in a boardroom in this agency and I'm having a discussion with the client telling them they don't know what they're talking about. I'm the director. <laughs> was like, oh, what shit. a fucking idiot I was. You know, it's like understanding, like, how the process works and, like, what your role is is super yeah. important, you know? Yeah. You know, it's the same thing on set. Like, you're on set sometimes and, like, some, like, a PA who's a production assistant, like you want everybody's input at certain points, but there's sometimes people be like, I think you should be doing this. You're like, who, what? Like, who's this? What, where are you? Who's this person? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Craft services just suggested yeah. that I changed my direction. <laughs> yeah. You're like, not, you're like, this is obviously your first time in set. This is not how sets work. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what was, it? what was the question? Biggest the learning question curve. Was, oh, biggest learning curve. Um, I think, in, I mean, I don't know. To me, the biggest learning curve is, is, um, I don't know, just trying to create the look that's in your head is the biggest learning curve because you can see it, you can see other people's images and then trying to recreate that is, is never the same because there's so many variables Yeah, and they're constantly changing. And I think as a DP for me, it's, you know, if, if you're shooting a scene, say you're outside on the street and you're shooting a, a, someone having a conversation. And a lot of times when you shoot these things, you're spending five or six hours shooting that one scene on the side of the street. Yeah. So during that whole time, the sun's moving, the sun's not staying in the same place. So you need yeah. to make that look consistent. Like it looks the same for five hours, Which is you so know, hard. trying to figure out like, how do you do that is not easy, you know, yeah. and it takes a lot of trial and error and I still, it's still not easy, you know? Yeah. So I think that to me, it's like lighting and creating like the consistent image that you want is, is super difficult. Yeah. You know? Have you heard of, um, Epic light media? They have a mm-hmm. pretty pretty good YouTube channel, and they just like I've learned a lot from their their channel. They break down lighting setups, and they super emphasize like put one of the biggest or the most important thing when it comes to like commercial filmmaking is like having full control of the lighting and being able to be consistent. So what you're talking about, like being outside as the sun's moving, harnessing the sun somehow, or like creating a bounce to make it look. It's just like. Shoo. Even on, yeah, just like it, it's, it's tough. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's one of the tricks is like, if you, the north side of any location, north side of a building is always in shade all year long. So if you're shooting south with your lenses looking south, you're always looking into the shade. So that's never going to change and you're going to always be backlit on your subject. So it's like tricks like, like that. that. Yeah. Always like, you always want to look south as much as you can on a location if you're going to be there for a long period of time. Cause then the, you're going to be backlit the whole day, you know, and it's more so in the winter because the sun doesn't go as high as a, you know, angle cause summertime, like the sun gets almost to 90 degrees in the winter time. It may only get up to like 30 degrees, you know, yeah. depending on where you are in the U S or elsewhere in the world. That's a damn good tip, Joe. 
Give me go. Yeah. Two, two more, two more tips, two more tips two from more Josh Simon. Tips. Out. Yeah. Hot tips. Oh man. I don't know. Besides that, it's... let's say I'll give you a category. Uh, there you go. Um, composition. If yeah, that's category. <laughs> composition category. Um, <laughs> co- compositionally, I mean, depth is your friend always in the sense of like, f- if if you're shooting into spaces, look for the you know to create depth in the room. Like so, say yeah. like looking at the background behind me. This isn't a great, a great one because we're pretty flat on the wall. But like having more depth and separation between your subject is really great yes. for your composition. Or looking yeah. into a corner of anything, like looking to the corner of a room, yep. is going to look a lot better because you're looking at two lines intersecting. You know, yeah, so using like directional kind of lines, mm-hmm. like like my it's corner. Like, Exactly. See, like you've done. It's it's all about compositionally using lines to to draw the the eyes of the viewer to your subject. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah. All right, that's our composition tip. What other category is there? Use lines. And then... <laughs> use, use lines. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, camera settings. I Ooh. like. Well, this. I mean, I kind of understand the basics of the. You know what's it called the 90 degree 180 degree rule mm-hmm. uh what are some other what's a what are some settings for people out there listening that like maybe are interested in filmmaking that you it's a big no-no to do like don't ever blank i mean like i said shutter speed is one of those big things like shutter speed or when you're, when you're on a higher end camera it's called shutter angle so it's you know you want to your shutter speed to be double of what your frame rate is so if you're shooting at you know 24 frames a second you want your your shutter speed to be 48 yes or 180 camera or shutter angle which because the thing is like if you take your shutter because you don't have an nd filter on your camera you're like well i don't have an nd filter so i'm just going to take my shutter to you know one yeah and yeah. then everything becomes very choppy you know it's not gonna be as smooth i think it's it's different in bmx because i think a lot of people shoot at 60 you know yeah 30 because you want to have smoother motion so it's not as noticeable but basically in the in the filmmaking world if it's not action sports being at 24 is going to make everything look more film-like yeah and film-like is because it looks more like what your eye sees you know you see yes. motion blur yeah and motion blur is very important to make it feel natural natural basically yes so do so you find yourself on set you're shooting mostly 24 when you're on a professional set yeah all, yeah. all the time every every Makes never sense. shoot anything but 24 and then and even like let's get mystical like those i mean those were shot at 24 back back in those days as well interesting so you don't even like care for the option of slow-mo like if you're shooting shoot, 24. but i shoot we shoot 24 base you know like you shoot 60 but then convert it down to 24 okay, so you have that gotcha, you yeah. know, slow motion right yeah um I don't know if I was to go back and film BMX, I don't know what I would do nowadays because it's a holder, you know, question of like, okay, how do you want it to look? You know, what's the right vibe or reason, you know, so. Just just thinking about your Let's Get Mystical work, like I'm, because I've been stuck filming with these VXs for literally 18 years. (laughs) Got so many VXs back there. Yeah, I really want to fuck around with like some HD BMX videos and I'm like, it's just a whole new world of like, you could develop a style or like there's, I don't know if you still pay attention to BMX videos, but Peter Adam, Rich Foreign, those are the two top dogs. I think in my opinion that I love who else, they do great work. Who else are you paying attention to? Like, are you still watching BMX videos? And if so, who are your favorite BMX filmers? Oh man, that's, that's tough. I don't think I watch enough to say like, you know, these are the, BMX filmers that I'm like into yeah. like I mean obviously Rich like does incredible work he does a lot of he did a bunch of new stuff you know not as much anymore but his true you know, yeah. his style and vibe is has always been you know really, he rode really for great. me for a bit right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah solid Rich's dude I mean him, and obviously you know Peter Adams does great stuff um yeah. beyond that I mean um I don't know that many other people but like Christian Rial, but yeah. he's doing a lot more mountain bike stuff now. But he's always done yep. great work, and you know his riding's always been pretty crazy as well. So, so crazy, cool. <laughs> he's a madman. <laughs> yeah, a I solid love, guy. Yeah. And he was one of the first people that I saw like take a red and make BMX videos and run with the movie behind Chad yeah. Curley while he's doing a super long nose mail and doing the best. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I remember Market Zero came out the same year that Mediocre at Best came out, which was my uh little bmx dvd and it got nominated for nora cup 
And oh got, yeah. And we got beat out by market zero and then those sons of bitches do it. <laughs> it always happens. Yeah. But they, I was always like, I always wanted to win a Nora cup. I never, I don't think I yeah. ever was even nominated. <laughs> I never even made it to the nomination stage. <laughs> It's a, it's a beautiful it's like it's such a small world the bmx community man do you still uh i don't know bump into bmx homies around like i actually texted yeah. aaron ross and told him to hit me with some questions for joe simon do you, do you, have you done projects aaron. with aaron because he's like all over the place doing his mm, uh, no, entrepreneurship I we aaron i see aaron and chase and um you know other people here in Austin, not super often. Um, Chase lives a little outside of town now, but I bump into Aaron, but he's always like doing house projects constantly. He's like, oh, yeah, remodeling this new house wherever. And you're like, oh, that's cool. So you know, he's doing his own thing. Super dude, Aaron awesome has so much awesome energy, man. Like I've never, I, he came over to my house to do the podcast and he was just <laughs> chatty Kathy the whole time. And I loved it. I love Aaron. Robinson. That's Aaron, man. That's yeah. It's so, such person, a good personality. Dude. Yeah. Chase yeah, Hawk he, says, Ask Joe how long he was addicted to beef jerky. <laughs> that's, a, oh, that's a good one. So I had, I, I had this like beef jerky container. It was like a, a round, I don't even know, cylinder plastic jar, mm-hmm. but it just kept my weed in it. Nice. So like every party I go to, I'd have the beef jerky. I'm like, who wants to hit the beef jerky? It was like years I had this thing for it. And it was just like my weed container. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It was funny. Side note on that, like I I don't know if you read that post I did with the the calling, but um uh I edited that. <laughs> this is a good story. I edited that in Ron Bonner's house. Um, and I was like, at that point, 2005, I guess it was like all early two thousands, like I could mm-hmm. not edit if I wasn't high. Like I had to be high. And at one point I was like, if I can't be high, I don't think I can make a good video. It's like not possible. Like I thought that's like, that was my creative process. Yeah. Um, and I remember being at Ron's house and I was like, just so high the whole time I was doing that video, like in After Effects, like animating, like all the fucking people moving off the screen and the text and the whatever, every, all the things. Beautiful. And I got a, then I get a call on Saturday, the weekend. And someone's like, Hey, where are you? I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, you're supposed to be filming our wedding right now. I was like, what? (laughs) I forgot. It wasn't, I didn't put it on my calendar or something. So I was supposed to be shooting a video in Texas. And I was like editing this thing in in Bonner's house. Damn day of dude. That's a day of. I had a call, like I called my, my, one of my, my, my friends was like, yo, can you cover me? It it all worked out. Like it was all fine, but it's nice. It was a panic for a minute. Like, yeah. Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, eventually I, I stopped smoking for a while and, um, I learned that I could edit without being high. So yeah, anything's possible. Yeah. I I used to think the same thing. I was like in my twenties editing Sabrosa's videos. I was, uh, on various drugs editing and I thought that was my process, but then you learn you don't have to be on drugs to edit. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Actually, it might be better because you're not spending five hours on two seconds. Yeah, for real. Yeah. You can get real locked in just watching the video over and over and over and over again while you're on some shit. Or being like, uh, this is the best thing I've ever made. And the next morning you watch it like, oh, man, this is not good. That I can relate to you so hard. <laughs> Literally everything I put out, I hate it immediately. I think I think I heard you say that in your 2017 yep. podcast. It's just like, because you see everything that could have been better, but to everybody else, they're like, "Oh, this is freaking amazing!" But to, in mm-hmm. your mind, you know, like, "Ah, oh, it could have been better this way or that way." Of course, never ends. Uh, one other thing from uh, Chase's and Yellow Jackets question mark from. <laughs> <laughs> we did this we took a road trip once from austin to uh the kona park in florida for a contest i can't remember what that contest was back in the day chase was probably like 12 at young this chase point. nice young chase yeah and this was like the chase that was like i don't remember there was like an interview that came out he's like people that do drugs and like drink are so terrible he's like i would never do that like, <laughs> he was like 14 and like Fast forward like one year later, he's like, this is getting so hot. It's, it's pretty funny. Um, uh, we took his road trip to Kona and um, we were driving a van just like, you know, for hours, like normally a road trip. And so we stopped at this gas station that had these things called Yellow Jackets, like energy pills, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we took them and like they banned them eventually. It was basically like speed. But we were like, sure, dry, we were, like so foggy. 
and we're driving like 80 90 miles an hour down the freeway just like screaming in the car just geeking. like 3 a.m just <laughs> geeking out <laughs> so miss surprised no one died on that trip amazing yeah the um, yellow amount jackets. of yellow jackets shout out yellow jackets all right that's that's the questions from aaron and chase, chase. of course yeah. chase those are, his, those are the kind yeah. of questions yeah. chase would ask yeah, We've had, yeah me and chase dude, i've seen that kid come from like that the little like dorky kid at 9th street with you know the skinny wheels jumping yeah. stuff to like you know think monster he is today the, the you know incredible Legends. rider yeah. yeah living legend and yeah. still doing it longevity is still incredible going. yeah solid um, dude if you were to do a bmx video in the future would you do it for burn slow that's what aaron asked actually like, <laughs> when, are you, when, are, when are you gonna do a burn slow video that's aaron he talked question. to me about this it just never happened you know yeah. if aaron hits me up i'm gonna figure it out aaron aaron come get on your, aaron get your budget up and then you can hire joe simon dude that's right <laughs> no, i'd love i mean i'd love to make i'd love to make like a bmx video i've always wanted to do something that's like you know i I want to say more mainstream but i don't think that's the right word but like something you'd see on hbo you know that you yeah, like yeah it's like a documentary that's more about the lifestyle and like what a narrative world is like yeah. you know not not like you know there's a video of tricks because there's so yeah. much more like you travel overseas and like just the kind of shit you get into and um you know i just think it's really interesting and most people don't understand it they think like oh you're a pro it's so cool you're just traveling the world and like yeah, you're like no i'm couch surfing and yeah. like trying to like have enough money to eat and like buy beer and like whatever else you're doing and it's, you got you know, a ten dollar per diem you know like yeah and then you're like busting your ass all day long to get like one trick you know that you spend yeah. four hours trying to you know it's it's crazy that's my favorite thing to try and explain they're like oh you're working on a bmx dvd cool how long have you been working on it i'm like four years and they're like wow <laughs> i'm like yeah it could take 10 hours to get four seconds of footage which is crazy man yeah. um uh da, da, da. it really is hard it's a this is definitely mediocre at best too is definitely my last full length like project I, I i'll always film bmx but never again doing a full like eight riders having a section type thing especially while i'm trying to live life mm -hmm. and do other stuff at the same time it's just hard it's also hard just with the you know with all the social media now it's like you sit on a trick yeah. for too long like then you know then what happens like someone else does it or like yeah, what you know it's exactly just like, it's hard there's stuff that i have for my part that i've seen multiple people do now and on their instagrams and i'm just like i don't care <laughs> fuck it i'm still putting my shit out you know <laughs> yeah i mean you can't i think it's yeah. always i mean you know it's always been amazing seeing full sections come out you know yeah and that's um, something special to it yeah I mean, especially like, you know, all the stuff Stu's always done, like Anthem and like those videos yeah. are like always like so epic and, you know, yeah, it's hard to beat sitting down watching a full, a full video. It's just yeah, dope. exactly. What's, what do you think is the perfect length for a full length BMX video? Oh man, that's tough. I don't know. 40 minutes. Yeah. That was exactly the number in my head that I thought you were going to say 40. I think, <laughs> I think 40 is perfect. I think too long like personally i just kind of like i'm you know over it. i don't know other kids nowadays they might be able to sit there for three hours i don't know but yeah an hour it's too short it's too long hours too long and 15 minutes actually 15 minutes is kind of a sweet spot especially if it's only like three or four riders yeah i've always, i mean 10 to 15 is always nice i mean that's like the stuff i was making and like the i mean that that spring 2008 spring video for mutiny that was like the hd one i shot with like a 35 adapter on the camera uh, it's like a thing they used to make the brevis that you'd attach to like a camera and it was literally looked like a cannon because it was so big uh -huh. so you get depth of field out of it yeah um we made like everybody's names out of foam letters and like set it up on obstacles and people were doing tricks yeah okay i remember that yeah yeah holy shit like that, that was, was 12 minutes yeah that video went pretty hard so like, that sure kind of did. stuff was always fun yeah i love that that sticks out in my head the names cut out in blocks and put on various spots that was that was, that was beautiful that... yeah I mean, so, now you can just do it in post <laughs> yeah for real uh are you good with like post and after effects like all the all nope. that shit no yeah nope. that's a whole nother ball game um i've done it when i've had to in the past but i, I don't do it anymore i have i have a couple of vfx guys now that are just they're incredible and they always do stuff for me specialization so, yeah. you know uh what so like as a freelance 
cam op or dp what do you have your own gear or do you rent for each shoot uh both i have uh an alexa mini camera so it's like the the area is kind of like the one of the kind of cameras they film a lot of movies with yep. and then um i kind of have a full kit so i have like monitors and director's monitor and um uh, uh movie you know pro gimbal and i have an inspire 2 drone and um a set of lenses kind of like cinema lenses stuff. like cinema prime. lenses, yeah yeah like tokina vista primes is the ones that i have so it's Sick. like a prime set yeah Next they level. each weigh five pounds or way too heavy yeah just just use them when i have to because they're they're really aggressive so why do they start calling it t t instead of f on uh the cinema cameras you know i've i've read that answer many times and i can't remember what it was it's it's basically it comes down to like it's scientifically the t is more accurate ah it's the way that it's it's derived but yeah they're basically you'll see like they'll be like oh this lens is a a 1.2 f stop and then if you see the t version it's like a 1.5 it's like no nah, it's not really a 1.2 it's more than 1.5 that's so. interesting for anybody listening who doesn't understand what we're talking about like a, a camera lens can has i think it's aperture that's the that's the right term right and it that f the lower the number the more depth of field you have so like you want you want something that has like f 2.8 is very common but then when you get to cinema level they start they stop calling it f 2.8 and they start calling it t 2.8 or t whatever and it's just arbitrary seemingly but it's uh you know it's part of being part of the cinema club you know your cinema head yeah there's no there's no autofocus there's no there's no auto anything it's all like manual it's just like you know because everything is like precise and it's like this is the exact setting planned out and you have time and that's beautiful you never have enough time yeah that's true yeah dude i i just had to shoot like a little promo in a low rider car and like total time allowed i showed up and then 45 minutes later we're done shooting done First of all, writing the script, planning shots, and then doing everything oh, yeah. within forty-five minutes—it was a nightmare. And it Sounds turned about out right. It turned out okay. I and I, I shot it horizontal, and then ended up having to make it vertical for social media. So, what what are your thoughts on that? Like the like media consumption, a lot of it is on your phone vertical. How do you feel about that? Do you do you fuck with that? Um, no, I, I it sucks, but it's just what it is. You know? It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, almost every commercial I do is you're framing and have and have frame lines pulled up on the screen they're like okay here's 16 by 9 here's 9 by 16 and here's 4 by 5 so they can make sure everything is going to fit and they have all the media buys for TikTok and Instagram and Facebook so yeah yeah it just sucks because like it for a while Instagram actually had you could turn your phone sideways and go full screen you know yeah. on videos and i was like oh this is fucking dope and then they stopped doing it i was like why did you stop doing that for real you can't turn yeah i i I've noticed for a that while too. it happened i was like this was great you know? yeah it's a little version of youtube yeah. um what movie outside of bmx has inspired you the most who's your favorite uh dp out there oh man um i mean roger deakins is is you know one of my favorite dps just because he's so solid in, in the work that he does yeah um you know and um just yeah just an incredible body of work obviously um but I'll say like some of my favorite movies. Uh man, that's a tough one. I like I like kind of um one that pops in my mind is Place Beyond the Pines. Um great Ryan, film. What's it? Ryan, R- Ryan Reynolds? No, no, wrong wrong Ryan. Ryan Gosling's yeah, in there. Ryan Gosling, yeah. Uh, that, was that, a beautiful and, one. that and Drive and um Blue Valentine, all star Ryan Gosling, but they're all also I think uh, two of those are the same director. Place, Place Beyond the Pines and uh, Blue Valentine are by, um, I can't remember the director's name, Cal, Cal, Cal something, Califace, I think is his name. But uh, great work. I like darker movies that are still like very human human based and like the, the basic emotions and, and storytelling. You know, it's not like it's yeah. any crazy, it's not like crazy effects or, you know, anything yeah. really out there, but it, um, but it tells a really interesting story. I'm with you on that. What do you think yeah. of uh, Birdman and The Revenant? Um, both great movies. Um, I mean, Chivo is an incredible cinematographer. He definitely yeah. has his like wide wide lens vibes, which yeah. which I I'm down with. Um, 
Uh, I like. I enjoyed Revenant. It was a really yeah. good film. Dude, when I first saw Birdman, I was blown away. I was like, "No way! It's all in one <laughs> shot." And then I'm like, like focusing, trying to find when the cuts. The when cuts, the cuts. Yeah, yeah it's magical. Yeah, man. yeah it's like same as, as 1917. You know, they did the same thing, like just yeah, hiding yeah. the cuts in there. Yeah, yeah. Epic. It's a great. Movies. It's a great technique. I mean, it's 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 tough to pull off. Um, I saw one on your Instagram that you did a long continuous shot that like it was in inside of a house and kind of dark mm-hmm. and it was a party scene or something and pretty yeah and, yeah and you I, just picturing you doing that is so sick man it's, it's an honor <laughs> to talk to you man <laughs> that was awesome that was actually yeah that was actually a one take there was no cuts in that it was yeah so long many I think we did five or six takes takes holding the movie for too long basically <laughs> yeah you're buff after that yeah you're getting a lot of arm pump hopefully yeah. you survive I love that. That was a fun movie. I, I, there's something about a long continuous shot because it's like a it, it's like a hybrid between a movie and a live play because you know it all has to happen all in one, one try and there's a lot of rehearsing and going yeah. through it and I respect that I love that. All right, it's fun. Uh, favorite BMX. Okay, let's do Mount Rushmore of all time great or all time favorite BMX riders. There's four all time favorite. Yeah. Four, four choices. No, like what's your Mount Rushmore of BMX riders? Oh man. Uh, Aiken. Beautiful. I'd say one. Um, man, that's a tough one. Where do I go from there? Um, I would say Joe rich always like looked up to Joe, man. He's such an incredible writer. Um, I think more modern era, um, Reynolds is like insane, yep. you know, like just watching that dude ride is mind, mind blowing. Yeah. He's our Michael least. Jordan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I feel like I gotta go someone classic. Uh, I don't know who, I'm trying to think like back when I was like younger, who I was like looking up to and just being like, wow, that person is is so great but i'm drawing a blank i don't know give me a minute i'll come back to it <laughs> all right cool. last one. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh favorite bmx full length video besides the ones you've made obviously in the ones i made they're the best, yeah, ones they're out the there, best, right? best quality uh i would say little devil um the f- uh seek and destroy probably my f- my favorite video of all time hell yeah that's what's up yeah what clip sticks that came out, out in your mind from that video? Um, Garrett jumping off the roof. I don't know if oh. you remember that part. Yeah. yeah. Or Van manualing down that rail. Yeah. In Philly. Yep. Legendary. Yeah. Iconic. Okay. Yeah. I remember because Daryl Nah back in the day, also like Daryl Nah, amazing human being. Yes. Um, we, I was living in Bethlehem for the summer when that was coming out, and I was li- li- renting renting a place with Jason Sunday and my other friend Dan Darcy, and we're digging at Posh every single day. We lived there for like three months, and um, Daryl came to visit, and he showed us a video, <laughs> showed us the video before it came out. I was like, "What the fuck?" It's like you made this video, like, Little oh, Devil. Was blown. Yeah, the Little Devil. Yeah. Daryl now made Little Devil. Yeah, not Little Devil. He he edited the he edited, he edited Seek and Destroy. Oh I'm no shit! Sure. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I like because I I'm in a I'm maybe you know two generations of BMX after you and I know Daryl Na but I know him as the announcer and the long yeah like just the personality I had no idea that he edited Seek and Destroy that's fucking rad I'm pretty sure unless my mind is like totally you're probably broken, right but, yeah no yeah. yeah that's dope I'm learning but, so much doing this fucking podcast man because there's so much bmx nerd shit that i don't know you know it's, yeah, I'd, I'd add van home to the to the riders list yeah obviously right. yes yeah cool boom that's it that's your that's your mount rushmore yeah there's so, too many people to mention it's crazy i mean there's so many it really is yeah riders. is there anybody i mean you're not quite as in it as other people i've been asking people like who should i know that i don't know like right now like young up-and-comers but i would imagine you'd I have, no I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> How, okay, so like, let's let's apply there's that. So to many, there's so many kids. It's insane. You're yeah. Just like, Who? What? Where? Hit me with a couple of like uh, films that I need to watch as a, you know, if I if I want to 
you know, heady, heady films that I should watch. I don't know if I have much. I don't, it's funny because I, I watch films, but I don't, I mostly watch them out of entertainment more than, oh, nice. than like yeah. learning just because I, I'm trying to get away from what I'm working all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think more than anything I do that, but um, I think for me, it's, it's like, there's some certain films that are just incredible, like Jaws, like Jaws, the first Jaws. That's a great film just as far as cin like cinema learning and the way that Spielberg works and like the way that he blocks and the way that he controls the camera and what the camera sees is it's, it's like you can just watch that film and learn so much about how to move a camera, when to move a camera. That's interesting. You know, I should rewatch Jaws. the attention's on. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's really incredible. And there's also a lot. There's like a lot of YouTube videos that break down that movie because it is so iconic in that in that way. Yeah, uh -huh. all time favorite director. All time favorite director, um, probably Fincher. Fincher, I think like yeah. Fincher, David Fincher, Fincher, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. David Fincher. Um, just because he he's is so consistent, like Seven is one of one of my favorite movies that he's done. Phenomenal, like just, incredible yeah. movie. Um, and then like totally opposite from that, but like the Social Network's also a really great movie. But David you know, Fincher did different. Social Network. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, I love that movie. But that's his, his, his. He's so just like his attention to detail, like all of the films that he makes, like even the new newer TV shows. Um, there was that drama, not drama, but there's that prison interview sh movie he made. If, couple years ago they only made two seasons and then, then he's like i don't want to make it anymore uh where they interview the serial killers yeah with the interview the serial killers Fuck. Um, i can't remember what it's called but i know exactly what you're talking uh, about so annoying that was um, really well done it's really well but but it's crazy because like so many things you would never notice but because of the time it was made in the 70s or 80s they didn't have handicap ramps on sidewalks this wasn't a thing so in every place they film he removed those so it was just curbs or like there's areas he filmed and like the trees didn't have the right color leaves or oh, change all the leaves on the trees. Like all these things that you would never know is that VFX shot that is because of the time of year they need to be there or like how the street should actually look. And like, it's, it's insane yeah. how like meticulous he is with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you, if you had the option to like, oh, we can just do that in post with, with visual effects or doing it practical, what, what's your preference? Practical is my preference, but um, I think there's so much you can do in post that most people don't realize was already done in post. You know, there's so many things you see where they add, you know, they change the sky. Like there's so many sky replacements yeah. all yeah. the time. Like you would never notice or, you know, they're they're adding fog in the background or, or haze or smoke in the background or they're like, you know, there's something ugly in the frame they have to remove. It's like nonstop happens. Yeah. But most people that don't have the budget can't do that. And your work also suffers because you're like, well, I wish the sunset was nice today, but it's cloudy. And but you know, you can fix if it. If you have money, you just fix it. Yeah. Yeah. That's you interesting. Yeah. What do you think of Stanley Kubrick? Stanley Kubrick's amazing. He's I mean, yeah. that dude's a genius. Yeah. Um his his films are 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 great. Um but He's yeah, I've, like literal genius, like IQ on a billion. Um <laughs> also crazy. Yeah, I think many, many yeah. artists like that are it's like they make incredible work, but they're also very difficult to work with, you know, yep. because they're assholes and yep. they're like this my way or the highway. Yeah. Um, yeah, they make good stuff. <laughs> yeah, like Kanye. Kanye is a <laughs> crazy He's genius. literally crazy. Yeah. yeah. Music's incredible, but crazy. Um, uh, the, 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 do you think we landed on the moon? <laughs> Speaking of Kubrick, mm, definitely didn't land on. There's no way we landed on the moon. No, we landed on. Yeah, I think we did. I think that we landed on the moon, but maybe we faked some of the footage. I don't know. I haven't really dove into it. Have you ever dove, in, dove into the no, that, that I don't conspiracy? Really pay, no, I don't really. I don't really get involved with conspiracies. I just like don't give a shit. I'm just like yeah. there's so much other stuff I'd rather focus on, yeah. and like I barely have time to like sit on the internet. And, like, let me just like see what's yeah. going on. Yeah, because like, there's YouTube uh documentaries dedicated to all the clues that Kub kubrick left in the shining yeah. <laughs> about that you, you've heard of this shit right yeah 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 so i don't know anyway dude. it's all, it's all a rabbit hole yeah for real yeah um what would be your advice to young bmxers and young bmx kids with cameras like what would you say to your younger self i mean have fun you know if you're a filmer i mean it's you know 
see if you love it and you want to keep doing it, like, you know, focus on it and, and see where it can take you. Because I mean, definitely, you know, cameras are going to continue to be super important to our world for forever. And it's going to keep getting more important. You know, I think that nowadays because anybody can, you know, use, even use your phone. Right. And, and yeah, make great stuff. Um, there's, there's not really a conversation of like, well, I don't have this camera or whatever. It's yeah. Do you let's have go an make iPhone? It. Yeah. Just let's it. go make it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think it's also, um, I think so many people, especially parents and other people are like, well, you, it's time to go to college and like, what's your major going to be? You're going to be a doctor or whatever. Like, you know, I think it takes time to figure that stuff out. Um, I never went to school. I basically just traveled riding bikes and then got into filmmaking. But I think it also opened my mind traveling to, to see what the rest of the world was like and like what other people were doing and what other people were accomplishing and, and it helped me to be like, oh, I can't, I don't need to go to school to, to do this, you know? Right. It's yeah. Like, if exactly. you have the initiative and you have the push, like, go do it, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. My, my thing is like, you know, if, if you enjoy filmmaking, then pursue it, you know, because it's, it's yeah. definitely possible. You know? Did you go to nofilmschool.com? Like, what forums were you on? I, I remember reading an article about you and talking about creative filmmaking community. And what was the forums that you were on when you were? Get man back the, back in the day i have no idea that there's a lot that don't exist anymore because it just yeah. were so you know social like, media sad out. sad forums back in the day um yeah. but i think you know like there's a lot of great podcasts nowadays and a lot of great youtube channels i think uh wandering dp is you know a great podcast with lots of of information um and that same guy also has like, you know, classes that, that he, that he does about lighting and other things, <clears throat> and also some YouTube channels and a Patreon as well. So there's a few people out there like that, that are creating good content and also breaking it down in a way that people can, you know, learn and understand. Do you so have a Patreon? You got a pretty substantial following from your I filmmaking don't. and BMX life. No, it's just like the time, the time to do it, you know, like yeah. that's the hard part. And I think it's if like, you're going to do something, you want to do it a hundred percent. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if I was doing that, it literally would have to be, I couldn't actually do my filmmaking stuff. Cause I would have no life to me. Cause yeah. really to me, my life work balance is super important. I like to travel and I like to go travel surf and I like to snowboard. I just like to do these things where, you know, I just want to fuck off for a month. I can, you know, that's I'm awesome. Like I got to yeah. stay home and make YouTube videos now because like, you know, it's yeah. like another thing I got to deal with. Yeah. So it's like I work hard and then I go on vacation and I work hard and I go on vacation. Like that's just, it's my life. I'm happy for you, man. And you said <laughs> your wife's name is Katie. Katie. Yeah. You guys got a kid. Are you no, gonna, we got, we got a, we got a dog, uh, no kids, just living life, living the dream, man. Yeah. Well, dude, two hours just went by. So I think, uh, we can call it. I appreciate that you coming quick. on. Yeah, yeah for man. real. It was good to chat. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it was entertaining and uh, you got those three tips you needed in there. And <laughs> Yeah. My future filmmakers, my BMX nerds, you guys should definitely look up Joe Simon's old footage and watch Let's Get yeah. Mystical. I'll, um, I'll, upload, um, I'll upload the other videos to my YouTube, which my YouTube is very sad, but it's you can find it somewhere. I think it's, it's... like Joe Simon DP or something like that. Okay, cool. Um, but my Instagram is just Joe Simon. I yeah. got on early, but yeah, you can find my website and other stuff from my Instagram. Everybody go follow Joe, Joe Simon. Thanks for taking the time, man. This is an honor yeah, yeah. for it's real. Good. I appreciate yeah. you. Hopefully meet you in person sometime. Yeah. I was just, I was thinking about that earlier. I was like, have we ever met or crossed paths? I don't think we have, but uh, now we have digitally. Yes. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll cross paths at some point. <laughs> right. World's small. <laughs> we'll All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Hello, you've reached the end of the video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Joe Simon. Uh, big thank you to Dig for partnering on this podcast. And uh, I'll see you next week. Don't know who the guest is yet, so it's a, it'll be a surprise. Have a good rest of your day.